Welcome to History's Shittiest Disciple. And today we're going to be talking about, or well, our Rondell Lockwood is going to be giving a presentation about animal crime and the animal crime link. So link down below to one study from Rondell Lockwood and a study from the U.S. Defense Department in 2001 talking about delinquency and animal crime. Now, here's the thing. If you've been following me on Discord, hearing me have discussions, debates, conversations, you've heard me talk about the animal crime link. Now, in particularly, if you're interested in the modern history of animal crime, this presentation is going to be the presentation for you because that's what it's going to be talking about, animal crime in the modern history. However, if you want to learn about the history of animal rights and um, animal, the animal crime link, link down below for that video. Anyways, enjoy the video. Guys, um, thank you for coming. And um, originally, Sheriff Jack Mahar was going to make opening remarks. He got called away on some pressing business. He did extend his apologies. And so you're stuck with me with opening remarks. Um, so uh, we have a legend here tonight. And um, I'm humbled and honored to have him here. Um, a lot of you are my students. Some of you are not. So. Um, we did have an animal fighting seminar um, as part of the course uh, offerings for the Animal Advocacy Certificate Program this past semester. And during the course of the animal fighting seminar, we, we learned about the Michael Vick case, the animal cruelty laws and animal fighting laws in New York, um, some information about breed-specific legislation and, and really the way the media um, has handled pit bulls, and, and we centered around the Vic case quite a bit, and one of the key players in the Vic case was a Dr. Randy Lockwood, but he's so much more than that. I'm going to read a few of his um, high points and um, turn it over to him. Dr. Lockwood is currently Senior Vice President of the ASPCA in Forensic Sciences and Anti-Cruelty Projects. He has a doctorate in psychology from Washington University in St. Louis, has studied the behavior between humans and animals for the past 30 years, and has worked with humane societies and law enforcement agencies, serving as an expert in the interactions between people and animals. He has testified in numerous trials involving cruelty to animals and has spoken to such diverse and prestigious audience as the United Kingdom's Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, the Japanese Animal Welfare Association, and the American Veterinary Medical Association. Dr. Lockwood played a key role in the evaluation of the Michael Vick dogs and in changing the public perception that these animals should be euthanized. Prior to the case, it was a given that these animals would be euthanized as a result of his efforts and, and others on the case. Many of these are now home pets doing beautifully. Uh, Dr. Lockwood started, actually he was, the U.S., uh, the Humane Society of the United States' first strike campaign to increase awareness nationally and even internationally of the link between animal cruelty and violence against humans. I'm almost done. <laughs> it goes on, though. He's authored or co-authored several books, including Forensic Investigation of Animal Cruelty, A Guide for Veterinary and Law Enforcement Professionals, which is the first of its kind, Tru Cruelty to Animals and Interpersonal Violence, Perception of Animals in American Culture, Animal Cruelty, Pathway to Violence Against People, um, animal Cruelty Prosecution, Opportunities for Response to Crime and Interpersonal Violence, and the Dog Fighting Toolkit for Law Enforcement. He served as an expert psychological witness in cruelty cases, educated federal and state lawmakers on the need for stronger animal cruelty laws and humane education, and is considered one of the world's most foremost experts with regard to the now well-established link between animal cruelty and criminal activity, domestic violence, child and elder abuse, as well as at-risk youth and animal cruelty. Thank you, Dr. Lockwood, for your monumental and ongoing contributions to the furtherance of humane and compassionate existence for all living things. Folks, Dr. Randy Lockwood. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's good to be back at a campus in New York. One of the things you, you did leave out, I, I did do seven years time on the faculty of the State University of New York at Stony Brook. Uh, and and th th this is, I, I had the for good fortune or misfortune of teaching the largest class in the SUNY system in, in, of Psych 101 with 1,100 students. So I, I appreciate the opportunity for some 
perhaps more intimate interactions <laughs> uh, in an audience like this. Um, let me first of all give you a, a, an overview of what I want to discuss. And, and this is based on a presentation that I do for law enforcement audiences, including most recently at the Law Enforcement Expo in, in Las Vegas to introduce uh, law enforcement people to what ASPCA can do for them, what some of our activities are, and why they should care, why they should be interested in, in animal cruelty. I also do serve, I, I'm actually the, the official consultant to the New York State Police on crimes involving animals, and I was just up here two weeks ago to teach their class on, on uh, child abuse investigation, doing a, a piece specifically on its connections to animal cruelty. So we do work very closely, particularly uh, within the state of New York. I'll give you a little bit of background on ASPCA. Uh, it, it was the first animal protection organization in the Western Hemisphere. We are the oldest animal protection organization in, in North America, South America for, for that, uh, as far as that goes. Uh, started in 1866 by Henry Berg. Henry Berg is probably one of the most famous people that most people have never heard of. Uh, in his era, he was very well known, often lampooned in the media. Uh, he was appointed by Abraham Lincoln to, to be counsel to uh, Russia. Uh, he, he corresponded with many of the, of the luminaries of, of his age, was very influential. And in his travels around the world, he had seen a lot of animal cruelty, but he had also seen how the uh, RSPCA, which was founded in the 1830s, how they were uh, fighting animal cruelty through law enforcement, through a concerted effort to change the laws and to take animal cruelty seriously. And he asked, why, why can't we do this in America? And fortunately, he had both the, the money and the influence to pull it together, forming the ASPCA in New, in New York City, uh, using his social ties and, 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 and writing uh, New York's first comprehensive, actually the nation's first comprehensive anti-cruelty law. The wording of New York State's animal cruelty law actually still reflects a lot of the language that Henry Berg used back in, in 1866. But he also had the wisdom to realize that the general public and particularly the law enforcement community would not necessarily see the world the way he and his supporters did. And that if he was going to be effective with this new law, he needed to also have the authority to enforce that law. So written into the, the documents that created ASPCA was the provision that ASPCA has the law enforcement authority to enforce those laws, at least in, in New York State. Uh, because actually at the time, uh, he was very concerned about carriage horses, which we still battle in New York City to this day. He was very concerned about blood sports, particularly dog fighting. And uh, actually, a lot of the dogfighting that was going on in New York City back in the 1860s was being conducted as part of the re recreation that uh, police officers were interested in. A lot of police officers had come over from England and Ireland, and they'd brought dogfighting with them. So he realized he couldn't have animal cruelty laws taken seriously by counting on the regular police. He needed his own police force. And this was uh, the the way our officers looked back in 1866 uh, with their top hats. And this is, this is an illustration, I think, from, from uh, uh, one of the, the journals of the day uh, it's called Arrested for Cruelty. The man has overloaded his cart. And there are the officers of the ASPCA basically arresting him for overloading, overdriving uh, his animal. We continue to do this today when carriage horses are overworked or overloaded. Uh, dog fighting was prevalent in New York City back in those days. One of the, the key uh, areas where this was taking place was Kit Burns' Sportsman's Hall. He did dog fights, bear baits, cock fights, all kinds of, of stuff went on. And, and really, Berg decided he was going to be uh, Kit Burns' arch enemy. And in fact, back in 1868, we had basically the world's first dogfight raid conducted by the ASPCA, where officers came in. And uh, I, I really like this illustration because you know it, it shows our officers 
leading the animals away, not cramming them in a cage, not tying them up. They are leading them away from the scene of the crime. Uh, we don't really have any record of what happened to, to those dogs. Kit Burns did get off with a fine, but ASPCA was so persistent in going after him that eventually he had to sell the sportsman's hall and it was turned into a revival hall for, I think, a Baptist church. Um, we also know that, that uh, many of you, I think, are aware that ASPCA was involved in the first successful child abuse prosecution in this country. Uh, it wasn't the first one that we took on, but it was the first successful one in the spring of 1874 when social worker Etta Wheeler came, came uh, across uh, Mary Ellen Wilson. She was nine years old. She looks about six in that picture. She was undernourished, stunted. And um, she found her on a December day in New York City wearing this thin cotton dress and crying. And, and she told how her mother uh, beat her, cut her with the scissors. And she, Etta Wheeler went to the police and they basically said, nothing we can do. Back in 1874, children were basically chattel. You could do whatever you wanted. They were not unlike animals up to and sometimes even including killing them with, with little or no consequence. Uh, the, the legend is, and the misinformation is, that Berg used the newly written animal cruelty law to prosecute Mary Ellen's uh, parents. Not quite true. They did use a, a writ of habeas corpus to get her away from them. She was actually the first child who wanted to be removed. There was a previous case of a little boy, but he wanted to go back to his parents, and that case really went nowhere. But Jacob Rees, who, who's a very famous author, who, who uh, did a, a, one of the first photo essays on the tenements of New York called How the Other Half Lives, uh, he really created the mythology that somehow animal cruelty laws were used but it was significant that this was a case brought by essentially ASPCA officials and Eldridge Jerry, the attorney for ASPCA, and uh, did result in, in uh, the short-term incarceration of her parents. But she was removed from them, placed with a family in Philadelphia. That didn't quite work out. She was then uh, sent to live with a family in, in Rochester and lived happily ever after, and actually lived into the 1950s. Um, and she actually died in 1956 after raising several children. And a, a spin-off from that was 10 years after the founding of the ASPCA, the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children was founded, which does still exist as well. And this paralleled what went on in, in England as well. Uh, the RSPCA was founded in the 1830s, and the National Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children was founded about 10 years later in, in England as well. So I think it, it is worth noting that, that the uh, child protection movement really was an outgrowth of the animal protection movement. Uh, and there she was in the point. So this is not ancient, ancient history. She, she uh, was alive until the 1950s. Um, the public started to appreciate the role of what we call humane law enforcement uh, just in, in, in the last five or six years with the launch first of our Animal Precinct show, which was the first of the Animal Planet shows, and then its many uh, spin-offs or, or, or rip-offs. Uh, we have Animal Cops Houston, Animal Cops Detroit, Animal Cops San Francisco, uh, Miami Police. There's even uh, an Animal Cops Johannesburg show. We are no longer filming uh, Animal Precinct, so the ones you see are, are reruns, partly because it was kind of impeding some of our ability to respond to cases. But these shows have been very, very successful in raising public awareness of the fact that there are people out there in law enforcement who, who will protect animals and that there are laws that protect animals. And this really has, has helped um, advance our efforts in animal protection, and you'll see some of the other changes that, that, that have come, come along. And frankly, that's one of the reasons why I was with Humane Society of the US 
for 21 years and then about seven years ago left to work with ASPCA in part because of their interest in really expanding and formalizing their response to animal cruelty, working much more closely with police and veterinarians to advance uh, the investigation and prosecution of animal cruelty. Uh, so these are our guys today. And they are regular officers, go through the police academy, carry weapons, have arrest powers. We only have about 20 officers, so most of what we do is within the, uh, within the five boroughs. Although, technically, uh, reading our charter, we, we can serve as a, in support capacity throughout the state. And of course, one of my jobs is to take what we've learned in 140 years of investigating animal cruelty and share it with law enforcement officers around the country and around the world. So I've, I've helped train uh, enforcement officers, as was mentioned, in, in the UK, uh, uh, throughout Canada, uh, Japan, New Zealand, Australia, and other areas. Uh, part of my interest is, is really in, in bringing together the science of law enforcement and veterinary medicine and animal cruelty investigation and prosecution. And uh, when we first started, work, soon after I was hired, I said, I've always had a, a dream of having our own crime lab. And I, you know, when, when I was a kid, I used to do sketches of having my own little portable crime lab. And why can't we do what they do on on you know, CSI and stuff, and it turns out now, now I'm a consultant on CSI, and we have our CSI van. We actually now have three uh, vehicles. One's based in New York, one is based in, in Florida, uh, and we have a smaller unit also in Florida for rapid response. Uh, and we have used these vehicles for large-scale uh, animal rescue operations, including uh, you know, uh, hoarding cases, puppy mills, uh, and dog fighting cases. And we, one of the things we recognize the need to do is we have many people who are experienced animal handlers who are good at animal rescue. We learned a lot of what to do and not to do in uh, Hurricane Andrew, Hurricane Katrina, uh, but we didn't have a whole lot of training in processing crime scenes. Uh, part my, my staff, which is mainly based at, at the Maple Center for Forensic Medicine in Florida, are experienced crime scene analysts, and we do cross-training. All of our disaster responders are basically trained in at least the basic elements of documenting a crime scene. Our crime scene people are uh, being trained in animal handling and animal rescue. And so when we go into a scene like a, a large-scale animal hoarding scene, it is both a disaster in that there are many animals in need of medical care that need to be removed from a situation, but it's also a crime scene that must be documented if we're going to bring a case before the court. So we spend a lot of time cross-training a lot of our staff in both basic forensics as well as animal handling, animal care, veterinary medicine. We are equipped to do um, clandestine grave identification and excavation because a lot of people who, have, who do bad things to animals dispose of those animals, they bury them, they burn them, and we have people trained to basically exhume uh, bodies, which you'll hear about, we did that in the Vic case. Um, we do forensic entomology using insect evidence to show how long animals have had wounds or how long they've been, been dead. Uh, we, we do DNA analysis and, and, and other things. Uh, it's, as you well know, it's not quite like what you see on TV. You don't have one person who does it all and you don't get the answer in you know, 35 minutes. Sometimes it can take us six months to get uh, a DNA report from the Veterinary Genetics Laboratory. But still, uh, it, it, we really are, are moving animal cruelty investigation and prosecution, I think, to a much higher level and for reasons I'll go into in a minute. Uh, we have established uh, a, a connection with the University of Florida. The Maple Center for Forensic Medicine is the, one of the leading forensic centers. We have several graduate students. Uh, Lyra Sutton is one who's working on her master's on, on identification uh, of classification of dog remains. Uh, and, and we have a number of other students working there. We also have access to the Pound Laboratory, Pound named after William Pound, not, not an animal shelter. Uh, 
And the Pound Lab is, is uh, the largest human remains identification laboratory outside of the, the Hickam Air Force Base in Hawaii, which normally, and I was there last week, and there are skeletons laid out. And, and in one, we, we have a corner where we've got our chicken bones and dog bones and things like that. But we're using the skills of forensic anthropologists and osteologists and so on to help us with some of our cases. Um, some recent partnerships that I'll go into in a little bit more detail. Uh, as was mentioned, we were very involved in the Michael Vick case. We were involved in, in the world's largest dogfight raid back in 2009, which we call the Missouri 500. Uh, this was where we had teams in eight states simultaneously hitting 22 locations at the same moment, which resulted in the seizure of 500 dogs, most of whom were brought to St. Louis for assessment, medical treatment, uh, and eventual, hopefully, rehabilitation. And quite, quite a few, over half of those animals were actually eventually rehomed. And most recently, this year, we did work with the Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms uh, Division, the USDA, and local police with a, a drug weapon and dogfight sting uh, in, in Virginia. And I'll talk about those in a little bit. One of the other things, obviously, uh, you know, one of the advances in, in Forensic science is increased use of DNA, and uh, we work closely with the University of California at Davis Veterinary Genetics Laboratory, uh, and, and we, you can use DNA really for, for two basic things. First of all, identifying uh, does this blood come from this animal, or is this blood animal blood? And you know, there, there are a variety of different, different tests. Uh, what we, we were encountering problems with some of our dogfight operations in that people who we knew were interconnected, who sometimes we had email traffic or correspondence linking them, but they were denying that they knew one another. But uh, what we started when we had seized 500 fighting dogs was taking cheek swabs from every dog that we seized and submitting them to the Veterinary Genetics Laboratory and creating what we called the canine CODIS, uh, named after the, the, the uh, database systems for human DNA. And uh, one of the questions that we asked in this thing is, how were these different 26 different locations in eight states, were they connected? Did these people know each other? Were their dogs interconnected? And actually, we were able to show that people who said they didn't know, you know one another, well, it turns out you know, your dog is, is his dog's son and things like that. We, never, we have not had to use any of this data in court yet because everybody pled guilty pretty much. Uh, we had lots of other evidence. But we wanted to take this to the next level. You know, what we have learned as animal cruelty laws in general have gotten much, much stronger and the penalties for animal cruelty in most states, particularly dog fighting and serious crimes, reach felony level, often can, can result in two, five, even 10 years in prison for offenses that perhaps five or 10 years ago might have gotten you 30 days in the county jail. That means the whole system has changed. Uh, it used to be, in, even in an animal fighting case, uh, there would be no real attempt at a defense and now, if you're looking at 10 years in prison, if, it, if there are federal charges, you're looking at a $250,000 fine, suddenly the stakes are much higher. And you've probably heard of the CSI effect. Juries expect to see scientific evidence in high-profile cases. And if it's not there, the perception is you haven't done your job, you haven't proven your case. Even though you don't really need it, we've got all kinds of other circumstantial evidence, We've got uh, you know, wiretaps, we've got video, uh, but the juries want to see evidence. They want to see DNA stuff. They want to see ballistics. And what we're trying to do is meet that need uh, and, and overcome uh, a, a potential CSI effect. Also, one of our newest efforts is, is partnering with the National District Attorneys Association, which I've worked with for about 10 years, doing training for newly appointed district attorneys, and also the Animal Legal Defense Fund. So we have this joint partnership with ALDF, ASPCA, and the National District Attorneys Association to start the National Center for the Prosecution of Animal Abuse. This only launched about four months ago. 
Uh, and it was a natural outgrowth. The NDAA is, is the umbrella organization for most district attorneys. And it actually previously had two subdivisions, the National Center for the Prosecution of Child Abuse and the National Center for the Prosecution of Violence Against Women. Because, as you know and as we'll see in more detail, those crimes are often closely connected to animal cruelty, it seemed like a natural addition to the menu for NDAA to have a National Center for the Prosecution of Animal Abuse. And uh, they had used me for about 10 years to fill in that gap in their training, and we've decided to take it to the next level. And uh, ASPCA is the principal training partner for the National Center. We just did a webinar yesterday for 125 district attorneys on uh, the veterinarian as an expert witness in your animal cruelty case. And those are all archived. You can go on either our site, ASPCAPro.org, or NDAA.org, and actually you, you can watch these webinars or, or listen to them. They're, they're PowerPoints and audio. So uh, we really have ramped up in the last two years our efforts to reach out to those people who have law enforcement authority to help protect animals and to really raise the, the, the level of professionalism that we're seeing. So when I talk to uh, audiences in law enforcement, obviously the first question is, well, why, why should we investigate cruelty to animals? You know, I, we, we've got murders, we've got rapes, we've got robberies. Uh, why, why take the animal crime so seriously? Well, first of all, it is a crime, and it's a violent crime. And I've had some law officers who even say, you know, I don't really like cats that much, but it's against the law, I'll investigate. And that's often a hurdle that you have to get over. But it's recognized as a serious and often violent crime. This graph probably summarizes why I'm still in the business after 30 years, because it is good graphical evidence that we actually are making progress. When I gave my first lecture, on the connection between animal cruelty and human violence. In February of 1984, we had four states where animal cruelty could be prosecuted as a felony. Uh, only four states where if you burned, bludgeoned, tortured an animal, could you face felony penalties. Uh, I don't take credit for this change, but I think what has happened in the ensuing 30 years is that, that the public has appreciated the importance of paying attention to animal cruelty. Legislators have listened. The laws have changed. And law enforcement has changed this attitude. And we're up to 46 states now with some felony level penalties. Sometimes it's on second or third offense. But every year, things get a little bit better, a little tougher, a little stronger, despite uh, all the other uh, pressures and, and the fact that law enforcement, like everybody else, is underfunded and understaffed. Uh, and you know, when we hit 50, maybe I'll retire, probably not. Uh, but we, we should be there, certainly by the, by the end of, of, of the decade. There are a few holdouts. Um, but this really is good representation of the fact that animal cruelty is taken far more seriously as a crime than it ever was even 25 years ago. As I was mentioning to, to Valerie, you know, I used to get calls about some heinous crime. Some kids had bludgeoned a puppy to death, and I would call the sheriff down in you know, East McKee's port, and uh, he'd say things like, uh, well, hell, I'd done worse things than that when I was a young'un, and I'd feel sad for that community. I don't get that anymore. I'll call you know, you know, some, some sheriff's department out in the boondocks after we've seen some horrid report of an animal cruelty case. And usually the response I get is, we're taking this very seriously. We know it could, what it could mean for those young men usually involved in this case. Or, or you know, we are taking it seriously. And it's, it's quite rare that I get the attitude saying, what? Boys will be boys. It's just an animal. We don't hear that anymore. Or almost never. Uh, the public and professionals recognize that animal cruelty is an indicator crime. When you've got animal cruelty, you've probably got other crimes against people, against property that are going on hand in hand. 
Uh, animal cruelty rarely occurs in a vacuum. It is either you know, directly linked to other crimes or is the end result of exposure to other criminal activities. Uh, particularly in dog fighting, we always find illegal drugs at a dog fight, always, 100% of the time. Um, both illegal veterinary drugs, illegal human drugs. When we did the Missouri 500 raid, we had several uh, U-Haul trucks to haul in the evidence, uh, all of, not just the dogs, but, but uh, all of the treadmills, paraphernalia, and just the bags and bags of marijuana and pot plants and cocaine and everything else came rolling in. Uh, so, you know, there, there certainly is, is a close connection. We know that people who hurt animals are not nice, law-abiding uh, people. And sometimes they are, are uh, giving the illusion of being nice, law-abiding people. One of the people who was arrested with the Missouri 500 raid uh, was actually an instructor at a local community college who specialized in teaching handicapped children. He just happened to also be into dogfighting. And we actually had him uh, on videotape executing a dog that didn't do well. He's doing, I think, three years in state prison. Uh, we had a registered nurse, a male nurse, as one of the uh, people arrested in that dogfight raid. So, uh, but you, you scratch the surface of a dogfighter and you find someone with a lot of other issues. Uh, and I know in your readings and certainly uh, the notion of a link between animal cruelty and other forms of societal and interpersonal violence has become almost a cliche, but it is very well established. Uh, you know, I've written books on it, other people have written books on it. There is 200 years of literature making this connection and it continues to grow. Connections between child maltreatment and domestic violence are very strong, uh, elder abuse as well. When people are abused, uh, animals are at risk. When animals are abused, people uh, are at risk. That's a given now, and we, it, it's still surprising to me when we find audiences that just hadn't heard that before, because I've been living it for 30 years, but I'm sure you've probably encountered some people uh, like that saying, you know, you know, you got to watch out those, for those people that do bad things to animals. They, they, they might be bad people, or they're going to become serial killers. We'll, we'll talk about that in, in, in a moment. Um, Probably this connection is strongest in domestic violence. Uh, the level of pet ownership among victims of domestic violence, and we're talking about women in 95 plus percent of the cases. Uh, yes, uh, we do see abuse in, in uh, we, we do see men abuse, we do see abuses in same sex relationships, but usually we are talking about a he abusing a she uh, in, in the majority of these cases. And about three-fourths of women who seek shelter from domestic violence have pets at home. And about 70% of those women do report that their pet has been threatened, injured, or killed by their abuser. That means 70% of 75%, basically half of the women coming to a women's shelter have a pet at home that is at risk or has been harmed. Um, and often, having observed this dynamic in the family, the children exposed to that violence basically act out because they want to have positions of power and authority. They're struggling with their own lack of, of power. And about a third of children who witness domestic violence who have access to pets will act out through cruelty to pets, either their own pets or other people's pets or classroom pets, things like that. So it can be an indicator, again, if children are being abusive to animals, uh, it certainly can be an indicator that they are themselves victims or witnesses to abuse. Um, and usually animal abuse does, has occurred in the presence of women or children. One of the outgrowths of this recognition has been, again, a change in the laws. Uh, New York uh, was now, what, three years ago, New York did pass a law which allows orders of protection for animals in cases of domestic violence. Uh, New Hampshire and Maine were the first states. New York followed soon after that. And within two weeks of that law being introduced or passed in, in New York State, 
our officers were getting orders of protection for victims of domestic violence for their, to protect their pets. We now have about 20 states where that, uh, uh, that's on the books, and that's, that's uh, we'll probably have that in, in most states. It's usually an option anyway. We just need to educate the judges to that. I just did a training a few weeks ago for all the judges in Maryland to educate because we just passed that law after four years of effort in Maryland. Maryland was one of the states where the law specifically limited what you could include in an order of protection. A judge could say, stay away from her, stay away from her kids, stay away from her car, stay away from her work, and that was it. So a judge could not include a pet in an order of protection. The way the law was written, we had to change the law, and now it's in there that a judge can order uh, a perpetrator of domestic violence to stay away from companion animals in the home. And that's been on the books for several years in, in New York. Um, and we see these kind of cases every day. You know, I, 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 my morning coffee is spent reading the, the, the day before's clips, and then my evening coffee break is spent reading the other clips of this. So I get two loads of clips each day. Uh, and yes, you can get a pretty cynical view of, of the world. And, and this is fairly typical. Man who allegedly beat wife, killed kitten, is held is in, in Toledo, Ohio. Uh, he put his wife's kitten in the oven and told her, your dinner's ready. And we see stuff like this all the time. Ironically, I, in, in searching old, uh, old newspapers from the early days of ASPCA, I came across this from 1875. And here is Henry Berg investigating a case of domestic violence where the perpetrator of domestic violence has killed her cat. And he is hauling away the perpetrator. We've been doing this for 140 years. We've known about this since the founding of our organization. But we still have to keep bringing it up with judges, with prosecutors, even with some domestic violence advocates. But again, I think it's interesting. You know, the arrest afterwards, imprisonment for killing a cat, although provoked to the act by a cat nip. He, he claims the cat had bitten him, and that's but clearly it was a domestic violence motivated uh, interactions. I thought it was very interesting that, that uh, although the world really only discovered this probably in the you know, 1980s, 1990s, it's something that Henry Berg was getting involved in in 1875. Uh, he really deserves a, a lot of credit. My own entree into the field of, of uh, the link came through work I had done with the New Jersey Division of Youth and Family Services. I was asked to uh, answer a pretty simple question saying, what's going on with families that we know have abused children? And we actually had access to a population of 53 families who were in the system, uh, were, had to report to the Division of Youth and Family Services for reasons of child abuse, neglect, or endangerment who had been self-identified as having pets in the family. And I basically interviewed everybody in the family, every, all the social workers that had worked with the family, to try to get a picture of what was going on. And these are not um, you know, knock down, drag out, poor families. This is Princeton, basically. This, this is, for the most part, upper middle class white families, which are just as involved in, in domestic violence and child abuse as, as, as others. And first of all, what we found was that in these child abusing families, about 60% had done things to pets in the families uh, that could have been prosecuted as animal cruelty under New Jersey law, although none of them had ever been arrested or prosecuted because none of this had been discovered or reported. Um, if we just looked at those families where there was physical or sexual abuse of children, that rose to almost 90%. And again, in about a third of these families, though, the abuser of the animals was actually the child who was a victim or witness to other abuse. Again, we now recognize this as abuse reactive behavior of children doing unto others what they have either had done to them or seen done to others. Uh, a couple of other interesting things that came out of this. We assumed naively that families that were having problems of violence would recognize that you know, pets are wonderful, but pets are a pain in the ass. Uh, they cost money, they make messes, they do damage. 
Uh, and, and you would think if a family is functioning rationally, which clearly abusive families are not, but if they were, they would say, you know, this isn't a good time in our lives to have a pet. In fact, the opposite is true. Having a pet in the home, number one, it shuts the kids up because they, you know, they want a puppy, they want a kitten. It gives the illusion of normalcy. Happy families have puppies and kittens. We have puppies and kittens. We must be a normal, happy family. The big difference we found between the child abusing families and the control families in the same neighborhood was that, first of all, child abusing families actually had more pets, a little bit, slightly more. They had more animals. The big difference is they don't last very long. You don't go into a home where it, that's under investigation for child abuse and find you know, the 18 year old cat like mine sleeping on the sofa. You find puppies and kittens. And you go back six months later and you find puppies and kittens. What I teach child abuse investigators and what I teach in the New York State Police Academy is the best question you can ask a child in a child abuse investigation is, tell me about your pets. You don't even have to load the question saying, does anyone ever do anything bad to your pets? Did daddy ever hurt your Just tell me about your pets because they know what's going on and they want it to stop. And you hear stories like, well, we had a cat, but daddy hit it and it died. We got another cat, but it got sick. We had a dog, but it got sick and daddy wouldn't let us take it to the vet and it died. We had another dog and it ran away. This continuing story of pet loss. Uh, so significantly more pets under age two, significantly fewer pets uh, over age two. Ironically, and this is important in training veterinarians, veterinarians basically said, well, uh, you know, if they're being mean to their pets, they're not going to take them to the veterinarian. The use of veterinary services was the same in the child abusing families as in the, the so-called normal families. Uh, they had their shots and things like that. These were not generally, you know, poor, stupid, neglectful people. These were people with issues of family violence, but they were otherwise, which means animals who perhaps carried physical evidence of having been harmed were being taken to a vet. I've had vets say to me, nobody who hurt his or her pet would take it to a vet. But that's what pediatricians thought 20 years ago, that nobody who hurt their child would go to a doctor, and we know that's not true. Um, probably one of the things that has fueled the advances we've seen in the last 20 years is the realization that animal cruelty can be a predictor crime. That if we look longitudinally at uh, those who have been cruel to animals and follow them over time, there is a higher likelihood that they will be involved in other acts of violence, other crimes, interpersonal or societal crimes. Uh, and this is, again, not a new idea. Those of you who've heard me speak before probably seen these scenes from my, my uh, favorite artist, William Hogarth. He was a social reformer in the 1750s in England. Uh, his works were wildly popular. Uh, some people, art historians, have referred to him as sort of the Walt Disney of his time because everybody had some of his stuff. Everybody knew his stuff when they saw it. Uh, and in fact, his stuff was so widely um, stolen and, and, and reproduced illegally that our current copyright laws were actually developed uh, in, in England and were originally called the Hogarth Laws to, to protect some of his artwork. This is one of the series that he was proudest of, which he called the Four Stages of Cruelty, and probably depicted things that he actually had witnessed or talked to other people about. Uh, uh, this is a street scene in London in the 1750s, and there we see nasty young men, boys, doing all kinds of nasty things to, to animals, uh, including, um, you know, sticking the pit bull on, on the cat to get it ready for dog fighting, uh, preparing your rooster for cock fighting, tormenting the dog here, tying up the cats by their tails, throwing cats out of the windows. And the center of attention here is this boy, Tom Nero, who is plunging an arrow into this dog's behind well, the one nice boy who is supposed to be Prince George, the future King George III, is trying to get him to stop. 
Now, I thought this was somewhat fanciful as a, a, an unusual choice of torment until a good friend of mine, Diane Balkin, who is the district attorney in, in, Balt, in, in uh, Denver, sent me an illustration from a case that she had of a teenage boy that had done this to a dog. And ironically, that boy was successfully prosecuted. He had a lot of other psychological issues. He's placed in a secure psychiatric facility where he later committed suicide. Uh, but this, all of everything that you see in this illustration is something that's come across my desk, uh, sometimes in the last you know, couple of weeks. So Hogarth got that part right. And then he, he said, well, where's this headed? Where's Tom Nero headed? And here's a detail of, of what Tom Nero is up to. Well, Tom Nero becomes a carriage horse driver. Gee, we still have problems with carriage horse drivers. Uh, and he has overloaded his carriage with fat lawyers. And uh, he has beaten the horse to the point of breaking its leg and blinding it. Meanwhile, there are all kinds of other signs of moral decay in the world of England in 1751. Guy is prodding his donkey with a pitchfork. There's a handbill there advertising a cockfight that night. And again, these are all things that Hogarth was crying out saying, pay attention to this. This is a sign of, of uh, an ethical, moral apocalypse. You know, we, we, we can't tolerate this. Where is this taking us? Where is it taking the individuals that are involved in this kind of activity? Well, Tom can't use his horse and carriage anymore. He's lamed and, and blinded his horse. He's broken his carriage. So the only world open to him is to become a highwayman. And here he has left his girlfriend, Anne Gill, uh, pregnant, murdered, and mutilated. She has stolen silver from her mistress. And then she has written him this letter about how they'll run off and get money from the silver and live happily ever after and raise their child. And that was not in the cards for him. And this is how he basically rewarded her behavior. This is a fascinating illustration. This is 1751. This is more than 100 years before Jack the Ripper introduced the concept of a sexual homicide, a serial sexual homicide perpetrator in law enforcement. Uh, and yet, he must have talked to coroners and police investigators about what happens when someone is attacked in this way because he has accurately depicted defensive wounds that we see uh, particularly sexual homicide victims get when they're trying to ward off a knife blow. You know, you get, we always look for wounds to the hands when we suspect uh, some kind of assault. He's slit her throat and mutilated her in ways not unlike Jack the Ripper 100 years later, 130 years later. He has, and, and according to FBI profilers like uh, Bob Ressler and John Douglas, you've probably heard some of those names, he has accurately depicted the kinds of treatment of victim that you see in sexual homicide perpetrators with an adolescent history of animal cruelty. He got it right 250 years ago. Uh, so in my lectures to the Homicide Conference, which is held here every year, I basically credit Hogarth with being our first profiler, our first forensic psychologist. He was a brilliant observer of both animal and human behavior and, and uh, obviously had talked to police, had talked to coroners, had talked to physicians to get all this right. Um, obviously, things don't go well for Tom. He is taken out, hanged, executed, and here he's basically being dissected to train medical students. And here we see as part of the, the punishment, uh, his heart has been cut out and tossed on the floor where this old dog, who's the dog that he tormented as a youth, is devouring Tom's blackened heart. This is not just poetic justice. This was actually done in the 1750s in England. Part of the sentence for murderers was to have your vital organs fed to dogs or fed to animals. Uh, so he got that part right, too. Uh, we don't do that anymore. We live in the age of balanced and restorative justice. <laughs> and that's one of the issues I have to deal with, that, that probably one of the biggest disconnects between those of us who care about animals and care about animal cruelty and the state of our laws. We have good laws, but we still have sentencing grids, sentencing guidelines, 
And uh, if we have, particularly with violent juvenile offenders, if it's their first offense and it happens to be animal torture, there's a good chance that they will get probation. Uh, we're dealing right now with a case many of you probably are aware of, of, of the Phoenix case in Baltimore, two boys that set a, a female pit bull on fire that was euthanized a few days later. Uh, their first trial ended in a mistrial. Uh, they were supposed to go back on trial about two weeks ago. It's been, now been postponed till January. Uh, now, in the intervening period, both boys have committed other crimes, including attempted murder, uh, which probably they will face trial for, for that if they are, in fact, convicted of the animal cruelty case. Of course, the general public has been calling for them to be burned at the stake, pretty much what they did to the dog. The reality is they will probably get time served. Uh, and that's one of the disconnects that we have to, to, to deal with. Because uh, the reality is no matter how heinous our animal cruelty offender, they're going to get out of jail. And we have to be sensitive to that fact. And, and if there is something we can do to further protect the public and protect animals, uh, we certainly try to do that. Now, some of our scientific knowledge of animal cruelty as a predictor crime comes from what we call retrospective studies, where we take a population of bad people, people who are in prison for violent crimes, and we look backward at their youth and say, what did they do when they were young that maybe would have given us some indication that they were headed this way? There have been many studies since the 1970s. This is one that I was involved with, with interviewing um, about 100 prisoners in the Florida State Penitentiary who were divided into uh, violent and nonviolent offenders, by, not by how they behaved in prison, but the nature of the crime that got them behind bars. Nonviolent offenders are mainly burglars or drug crimes. Violent offenders were mainly murderers and rapists or occupied burglary or armed robbery. Um, and they were uh, averaged about 32 years of age. We then Again, delved into their background, not just their criminal history, but interviews with them and family members, and found that among the nonviolent offenders, 20% had past acts of cruelty to animals. And most of those were drug offenders who had been involved in dogfighting. But almost three times as many of the violent offenders had committed past acts of cruelty to animals. A uh, very high you know, correlation. And that's pretty much been consistent. Give me a population of violent offenders behind bars, whether they're sex offenders, murderers, rapists, child molesters. Generally, we find that between 35 and 60 percent, uh, we can document an adolescent or earlier history of repeated intentional acts of animal cruelty. That's not the same thing as saying every kid who hurts an animal is destined to be a serial killer. Um, one of the best studies to look at this connection from a prospective position, meaning you take a population of people you know have hurt animals, and then you follow them for five or 10 years and say, what else do they do? And the MSPCA did this with 153 offenders who had been prosecuted for animal cruelty, and they matched them up with a control group that had not been involved in an animal cruelty offense. People who were the same age, same sex, same zip code, same ethnicity. Now again, 95% of the intentional animal abusers were male. Uh, that's pretty typical. Uh, and what we found, what, what they found, looking at what else did these people do in that 10-year window, that the animal abusers, compared to their match controls, were three times as likely to commit drunken disorderly crimes, four times more likely to commit property crimes, five times more likely to commit crimes of violence, mainly assault and domestic violence. Um, what this study did not show was the progression hypothesis that you start out on animals and then you work your way up to people. Actually, um, that, that uh, they were about evenly split whether the animal cruelty offense took place before or after the other crimes. Part of this 
is that most of these offenses were, were cases before 1980. And there were very few juveniles in this sample because 20, 30 years ago, we were not arresting juvenile offenders for animal cruelty. The philosophy was boys will be boys. So we really didn't have an opportunity to look at young offenders as they matured. These were already kind of you know, career scumbags. Uh, what it is largely viewed as evidence for is, is a general deviance theory of the link that people who hurt animals are not nice people. They behave in other violent ways in other opportunities. Uh, that one way we phrase this is, is you know, the person who kicks the dog or beats the child or beats the wife, he doesn't stop to count number of legs on the victim. It's targets of opportunity. It is a general characteristic of the individual rather than a learned progression. Oh, gee, that, now we, we'll, we'll see exceptions to that of some people who specifically learned their techniques of torture and torment first in their interactions with animals and then did graduate. But the evidence for that graduation is, is uh, not as strong as we might like. We've got plenty of case histories uh, and you know, people say, well, those are just anecdotes. But when you start getting dozens and dozens of anecdotes, it becomes data. And I like to just pull out some of the you know, names that everybody knows, uh, like you know, Bonnie and Clyde. Clyde was involved in cockfighting, but he also tortured the animals, tormented calves, stole chickens to use for cockfighting. And he, he generally was a good example of that general deviance theory that started very early on. Probably one of the, from a, the son of Sam David Berkowitz, you know, murdered 13 people. This is an interesting case from, from a uh, forensic point of view as well. Before he was a serial killer, uh, he was a serial arsonist and often fire setting and animal cruelty and other violence go hand in hand. It's one of the reasons why I'm most concerned and put a lot of effort into those cases where animals are set on fire, which we get very regularly, because they have all those elements of animal cruelty, fire setting, and the potential for violent crime. Um, we tend to, you know, you don't hear about David Berkowitz, the arsonist. You hear about Son of Sam, the serial killer. He set a thousand fires in New York City carefully logging each one. And when I teach forensic psychology, we talk about the importance of getting school notebooks, getting, getting diaries, because you know, the old, old saw of uh, you know, the perpetrator always returns to the scene of the crime. Well, they don't need to anymore. Uh, you know, they've got video cameras. They've, they've, they've got digital cameras. They've got their notebooks. They can relive in their memories and their fantasies by documenting the crimes that they've done. And in some cases, they do revisit the scene. But here he even you know, noted the location of the box. Every, every point where he said he was a thousand fires, he was never caught for that. But before he was a serial arsonist, he was involved in a lot of acts of animal cruelty, documented by Bob Ressler, who coined the term serial killer, uh, now retired uh, FBI profiler, and documenting that starting at age six or seven, uh, he was uh, torturing uh, his mother's fish, killing her birds. And you know, a key observation from, from Ressler was, he tortured small animals such as mice and moths. All of these were control fantasies involving power over living things. For those of you that have been involved in working with domestic violence responders and, and work, have worked with battered women, you see those two magic words, power and control. Animal cruelty is a crime of power and control, just as a lot of sex crimes are not about sex, they're about power and control. Domestic violence is about power and control. Child abuse is often about power and control. That's one of the things that links all these crimes together. If you have someone who for a variety of reasons, biologically, developmentally, whatever, feels a need, an excessive need to dominate and gain power and control, feels that they do not have the deserved level of power and control, they often seek to gain it through exerting that power and control over those much weaker than them, often starting at a very early age. Typically, now we know animal cruelty is one of the symptoms that can lead to a diagnosis of conduct disorder in children. That's what we call juvenile delinquents now. It's conduct disorder. Uh, and if it's going to be part of the diagnosis, 
it usually it is the earliest appearing symptom. Uh, stealing shows up around seven or eight, lying about the same time, but animal cruelty usually shows up by age six or seven. So doesn't mean all six-year-olds who are cruel to animals are destined to have a diagnosis of conduct disorder, but those who gain a, a diagnosis of conduct disorder who are cruel to animals usually start by age six or seven. And that's an important point that we try to make with mental health care providers. And, and one of the disconnects is our juvenile justice system, our criminal justice system, and our mental health system is very ill-equipped to deal with very young offenders. Uh, and and you know, the best we can often hope for is recognizing that there is need for therapy, there is need for intervention, but often the courts really cannot deal with that. They can hopefully begin working with um, the families. In Maryland, uh, particularly in Baltimore, where I'm actually a commissioner in Baltimore uh, on the Animal Cruelty Commission, we actually have a mental health court where animal cruelty can be used as something we need to pay attention to. Of course, our poster child for this connection, Jeffrey Dahmer, who again started out with uh, his nice Christmas puppies and had the same, and uh, but about age seven is when he started engaging, and this, this is about age six, uh, and the following year he was doing things like collecting roadkill and then collecting live animals and vivisecting them and, and displaying them to the point where the neighbors were so concerned they actually took this picture uh, actually, uh, some colleagues at the FBI sent me this photo when they, they went back to uh, a crime scene in his boyhood home where they actually found a skeleton of one of his first human victim along with several animals, including cows, sheep, cats, rabbits, and birds. So again, we're not talking about you know, one innocent incident. We're talking about patterns of behavior that are well-established often at an early age. Probably the serial killer I got to know best is Keith Jesperson, uh, known as the happy face killer. Um, he's been in the news a bit more lately, I think you'll see, because his daughter has a new book out about, uh, there's, there's been a, a new rash of, of documentaries on children of serial killers. What's it like to grow up with you know, a dad who happens to be a serial killer? How I got to know Keith Jesperson was uh, in Oregon, in Salem, Oregon, uh, two boys beat one of the boys' mother's cats to death, two cats with a baseball bat. They were arrested. Their coach sent a letter to the editor of the local paper saying it was just a, a stupid act with a dumb animal, boys will be boys. The next day in the newspaper, the newspaper was just filled with letters to the editor of Outrage. And there in the middle was a letter from Keith Jesperson writing from prison saying, you better pay attention to this. That's how I got started. Well, I've been told by many media outlets, if you ever find a serial killer who wants to talk about how he got started with animals, let us know. I was on a plane with the, with the NBC TV crew uh, literally the next day. And uh, he was only too happy to chat with me. Very, very interesting character. Now, he's serving uh, three life sentences for murders he's been convicted of. He's facing, I think, two or three other trials. In my interviews with him, he claims to have killed about 123 people. And probably somewhere, he's probably killed dozens, but he tends to take credit for things he couldn't possibly have done. But very charming. He's a total, it was the first real total psychopath that I ever had a chance to sit down with. He's also about 6'9". Uh, you know, good looking guy. Um, um, but in talking about growing up in Canada and killing all the cats on his father's trailer park uh, and then killing a lot of other animals, he said, all this did is spawn in me the urge to kill again. I began to think of what it would be like to kill a human being. The thought stayed with me for years until one night it happened. I killed a woman by beating her almost to death, finished her off by strangulation. No longer did I search for animals to mistreat. I now look for people to kill, and I did. I killed over and over until I was caught. I'm paying for it with the rest of my life behind bars. We should stop the cruelty to anything before it develops into a bigger problem like me. Uh, and that's from his autobiography. And I asked him flat out, um, why do you kill people? And he said, well, because it's easy, and it makes me feel good. Uh, it makes me feel like God. You get to control 
if someone lives or dies, how they live or die, how quickly they live or die. That is the ultimate power. You know, it's all about him, all, all how it empowers him. Totally insensitive and oblivious to the suffering and feelings of others. That, that's the definition of a psychopath. Um, but uh, you know, he recognizes, most animal cruelty offenders that I've talked to over the years are not terribly insightful. Uh, when you ask a you know, 15-year-old kid, why did you set fire to this dog? They'll say, well, he was bored. You know, and that's about as far as you get with them. Jesperson was the first that was trying to actually connect the dots. He wasn't blaming the, it on abuse by his father, although there was a little of that thrown in. He just said, it makes me feel good. You know, it, 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 and, and, and he kind of, you know, now that we're buddies, now that I wasn't, because I've been briefed by a, a number of other forensic psychologists, you know, they, they, try, to, they try to test you to see uh, if they can get a rise out of you, and you don't want to play that game. So he was trying to shock me by telling me how he had killed one woman by uh, tying a rope around her neck and dragging her behind his truck until, quote, all he had was a bloody rope. And I think he expected me to lean over, you know, puke in the wastebasket or whatever. And having been trained properly by other forensic psychologists, I just said, how long did that take? And, and suddenly he was my best buddy, you know, him pen pals. He says, oh, he gets me, you know. No, I just, well, I mean, but that's, that's also one of, the, one of the dangers in this. You notice Bob Ressler's book is called Whoever Fights Monsters. And, that's a, and I feel I'm one of those people who fights monsters. And, and uh, it's a quote from Nietzsche uh, where he says, whoever fights monsters must, must remember whenever he looks into the abyss, the abyss is looking back at him. And most of my friends in forensic psychology have had some kind of breakdown. And we spend a lot of time uh, and attention with our own staff of animal cruelty uh, response and intervention on self-care, on supporting one another, and trying to avoid falling into that abyss. It's a scary business, but you know, we know we are doing good work. Uh, one of the things that keeps me going is I know there are animals children and women alive today that probably wouldn't be if I hadn't been doing what I've been doing for 30 years. I've had people give me that hug saying, you know, thank you for getting him out of my life or, or helping my animal. And that can help pull you out of that abyss. Uh, also, many of you probably have heard the case of, of Luke Woodham, uh, Pearl, Mississippi school shooter. He, uh, Killed his mother, stabbed his mother, went to school with several guns, killed his ex-girlfriend, Lydia, and her friend, Christina. So shot two students and probably was hoping that the police would shoot him, but the principal wrestled him to the, the ground. And in going through his diaries and his notebooks and so on, it came out that five months prior to this, he had carefully recorded... Um, uh, today, April 12th, 1997, uh, I made my first kill. The victim was a loved one, my dear dog, Sparkle. And he describes he and a, an accomplice going into the woods, uh, putting Sparkle in a bag, setting fire to her, and then throwing her in a river. Nobody reported it. Allegedly, this was witnessed. But uh, what the district attorney said, you know, he showed that he had the power to kill a living thing, and then go on and kill other living things. He didn't quite get it right. He had the power to kill a living thing he loved. And that gave him the ultimate power. And then he killed his mother, who he loved, his girlfriend, who he loved, and probably wanted to have himself killed in the process. I have not been able to interview him, but maybe someday. Um, and Al Brantley, uh, now retired from the FBI, I think was one of the first FBI profilers that I met who clearly got it and helped spread the word within the FBI Academy. So it's long been accepted uh, among professionals who must assess dangerous populations that the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior. What Bob Ressler said is what you see in the future is what you've seen in the past, only worse without intervention. That's kind of rule one of forensic psychology. A past history of violence is the single most important predictor of future violence. 
And then here's the whole point of First Strike campaign and my efforts over the last quarter century. Violence against animals is synonymous with violence, and when it's present, it's synonymous with a history of violence. And finally, you know, what I try to teach cops is, is, even if you don't care and you don't get it, the community does. Animal cruelty is one of those broken window crimes that if it's left untreated, unresponded to, sends the message, we don't care about our community. The things that bother you don't bother us. We don't have the resources. Hey, we don't have the manpower. Leave us alone. Uh, I've been trying to set up an anti-cruelty task force in Milwaukee. They have a new police chief who kind of gets it. And one of the interesting things that the Wisconsin Humane Society documented uh, recently was uh, there were some press reports about the arrest of a serial rapist. And there were also reports of an arrest in a case not unlike our Phoenix dog burning in Baltimore of a dog that had been set on fire. And the number of likes for the arrest of the dog burners was significantly higher than the likes of the story for the arrest of the serial rapist. And I get that, asked that question a lot by prosecutors saying, how come when I have an animal cruelty case, I get 8,000 emails, and when I have a rape or a, a child homicide, I get squat. And I don't have the perfect answer for that, but I think part of it is not. Part of it is we can all relate to how we would feel uh, with that animal. Also, the, the perception is that, that you know, animals don't have anyone to speak for them. That's, that's one of the reasons our motto is we are their voice. I also I like the, the uh, slogan for the Animal Legal Defense Fund, which is we are the only lawyers, all of whose uh, clients are innocent. Uh, and, and I think that explains part of this, this dis disconnect. These are just all the many comments of people praising the police for finding the kids that burned this dog. Uh, and the media cares about animal cruelty cases. Uh, we've got very good working relationships with the press, and you know, I'm sure my, most of you are familiar with petabuse.com, one of the best ways of tracking media coverage. So what kinds of things do we do? What have we done in the past? Um, I like to think that we, we really have a, a holistic approach that first, you need to have good laws. And obviously, a lot of our legislative efforts go to strengthen those laws. But there are communities that have very good laws and no enforcement. There are communities with crappy laws and good enforcement. So that's just the beginning. We obviously try to get the strongest possible laws. But then we have to educate the, the, we don't know that animal cruelty is out there unless the public recognizes it and reports it. That's where things like animal precinct have been so, so valuable. You know, I, I always echo the TSA's line, if you see something, say something, because uh, that is rule one in animal cruelty, get the community to report it. But that only works if the police are going to respond, if animal control responds. And when I started working as a commissioner in Baltimore, um, one of the first things we did was change the 911 and 311 system so that those calls were properly directed. Also, we were told a year ago that the Baltimore Police Department did not have the resources to assign an officer full time to follow up in the animal cruelty cases. Sorry, that's not going to happen. We just don't have the budget for it. Uh, Wednesday, I have a meeting with the officer that's been assigned to do follow-up on all the animal cruelty cases. You put enough pressure on them, you get the mayor behind you, you get the city council behind you, suddenly resources appear. So the public recognizes it. The police respond and investigate. You train the veterinarians to properly document the case. You train the district attorneys to want to and be able to move the case forward. You train the judges to care about the cases and not do stupid things like uh, assign the animal cruelty offenders to community service at the animal shelter. Uh, I just had a meeting with judges with a judge who had done that, and he now sees the error of his ways. I simply asked, how many pedophiles do you assign to the daycare center? Uh, and, uh, and then you also need to work with the systems like mental health that might be able to actually rehabilitate offenders uh, if there is a chance for that. So 
you can't just take one piece of this. You really do have to, and maybe you can't do it all yourself, but you at least need to see the holistic process. You need good laws, good police work, good veterinary work, uh, good prosecution, en enlightened judges, and it's a slow process. And it, it is, it, it takes almost a generation to get those societal changes. I like to use the example we've seen in the last year with all the efforts we've done. We really made Baltimore a target city because of the Phoenix case. And to me, one of the best illustrations that we've affected just the, the mindset of people and law enforcement in the community was we had a case fairly recently of a dead pit bull found on the Amtrak tracks. And a year ago, that would have been reported as a sanitation problem. We got a dead dog, scrape it up. It was considered a crime scene. They were looking for scars on the body. Is this a, is this a disposed of dog fighting dog? And the police were there and they treated it like a crime scene. That is a sea change, a major shift in the perception of animal cruelty in that community. And uh, uh, you know, we, we, some of you may have, might have seen coverage of Baltimore's just launched a Show Your Soft Side campaign where we have uh, people from, from the sports teams and others posing with their animals and the theme is only a punk would hurt an animal. And the latest, since they're going to be spending, I think, uh, a couple of weeks this month, the latest group of athletes to sign on to the campaign is the Harlem Globetrotters. And they just came in and had, were photographed with their pets for a billboard saying only a punk would hurt an animal. Again, hopefully shifting perception. Um, one of the things we do is try to promote and develop resources for all the professionals. We mentioned uh, several of our, our texts on veterinary forensics. This is pretty much it, everything ever written on veterinary forensics, but hopefully this is going to uh, change. If you haven't discovered ASPCAPro.org, great resources for uh, veterinarians, law enforcement, animal sheltering professionals. We do spend a lot of time on that. We have a close partnership now with the Shelter Medicine Program at University of Florida. We'll be doing a training in March on veterinary aspects of responding to animal hoarding cases. Uh, we have our partnership with the Maple Center. Uh, some of the courses we've offered there in the last year uh, crime scenes, we have our Bugs, Bones, and Botany course, uh, forensic photography, expert testimony, bite mark analysis, shooting reconstruction, we've done blood stain and sp spatter, gravesite excavation, basically bringing animal uh, cruelty investigators up to the level of even more better than what you might see on CSI. Uh, this is from our gravesite excavation course. Uh, you can't just go in with a backhoe and dig up animals. You know, you got to treat it like an anthropological exploration. We develop online training uh, in, a, in a variety of states. Uh, this is for Illinois. We have some training developed with the Regional Institute for Community Policing. We have the new uh, dogfight online course through the Department of Justice and the dogfight toolkit that uh, you'll see a press release probably going out tomorrow from the Department of Justice uh, with this which includes all kinds of different uh, things, tools for law enforcement. They came to me. Again, it shows how working locally can really pay off. Uh, it turned out the assistant to the director of the Community Oriented Policing Services runs a little shelter in Southern Maryland. And she wanted me to come in and train her investigators, about a dozen people, on basic animal cruelty investigation and dogfighting. And then a year later, after the Michael Vick case, her boss said, you know, we ought to do something about dogfighting. You know anybody? And they actually approached us, and, and the rest is, is history. Uh, as I say, we, we've expanded our response team. This is our field investigations and response team that does both disaster response and also large-scale crime scenes like dogfights, puppy mills, uh, warrior cases. Uh, and you know, working closely with the removal of evidence, documentation of evidence. Uh, and Valerie has specifically asked me to talk about the Michael Vick case. I think many of you know that the Vick case actually was initiated by a dog, uh, a, a, a detector dog that happened to um, alert to Michael Vick's cousin coming out of a bar uh, and alerted on the car, uh, and when they examined the car, there was marijuana inside. And so they 
took Mr. Bodhi back to the house where he was staying, which happened to be owned by Michael Vick. And when they showed up on the property, suddenly they saw all these dogs there and, and uh, other evidence went back and got another search warrant to investigate that. They found uh, fighting pit breeding stands and uh, they seized 66 dogs, 55 pit bulls, two Rottweilers, a Cana Corso, a Presa Canario, and they were eventually dispersed to a variety of, of shelters. Uh, then, actually, an informant who I still can't specifically mention basically alerted law enforcement to the presence of a lot of uh, dead dogs on the property. And initially, they did it wrong because they hadn't been through our courses. They kind of dug them up sloppily. But uh, after consulting with us, they went back and did it right. And uh, Melinda Merck, our forensic veterinarian at the time, uh, oversaw the excavation uh, of, of animals that did show a lot of evidence to the level of the bone of dog fighting and uh, beating and things like that. We were able to corroborate eyewitness testimony of how dogs had been killed. Can't document, it's difficult to document uh, drowning in aged remains, but we could document the beatings, the hangings, and dogfight injuries. And that became a significant part of uh, Vic's cohorts deciding to plead guilty and eventually leading to his, his plea. Uh, the pit bulls were seized, the three men were indicted, and uh, basically our forensic reports showed that the statements made by the informants about dogfighting and how they were killed uh, were, were substantiated by the physical evidence. Uh, Mike Gill was the federal prosecutor, and fortunately he said, you know, we don't want to just kill these dogs, um, which again was standard operating procedure for law enforcement at the time and fortunately called Steve Zawistowski, my boss at the time, and myself saying, could you guys help us out? We uh, basically developed a plan by evaluating the animals, making recommendations, which could include euthanasia if, if necessary. We also wanted to remain objective, so we had the court appoint uh, a special master to oversee the process independent of ASPCA or, or the court. At the same time, uh, Ed Sears, our president, met with uh, Commissioner Goodell, who had uh, Stacey Wolf, who many of you know, and, 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 and myself, develop training for the security staff of the NFL on dogfighting, uh, which uh, hopefully they are continuing to get. Um, the pit bulls became property of the Department of Justice under the care of the USDA. We agreed to go in and, and uh, refine our skills at, at, at assessing animals as we do in shelters and have done for many years. Um, and we did assessments of the 49 animals and then gave a final report. This is our assessment team uh, and including the, that's a fake dog in the middle. We do use fake dogs as part of the stimuli for that. Part of the research that's come out of this is we show, we've seen that Fighting dogs often respond to a stuffed dog just as they would another real dog, so we don't need to put other dogs at risk in the evaluation of them. Or if they're going to attack, a, uh, if they attack a fake dog, they will attack a real dog. If they don't attack the fake dog, they still may attack a real dog, but at least we don't need to expose them to a real dog. Uh, and then we have the baby doll too, although one of the things that, that, that impressed me immediately when we went out to look at the dogs, and these are the dogs from, from Vic's yard. I've been on a lot of dog fight scenes. These did not look like fighting dogs. The way the dogs behaved struck me as being the animals we see when we go to a hoarder house. These animals were not violent, aggressive animals. These dogs were scared, unsocialized animals. Michael Vick was a crappy dog fighter. Michael Vick uh, was a stupid dog fighter, and other dog fighters knew it, and they sold him junk. And they sold him junk. In, the, in dog fighting terms, in the, these were dogs that didn't particularly want to fight. They weren't game dogs, for the most part. The one dog that stood out as a, now that is you know, obviously some kind of champion. Turned out it wasn't a fixed dog. He was bordering it for somebody else. Uh, which meant that they had, when they did their testing, game testing, of exposing them to another fighting dog, see how game they were, would they fight, they would often not want to fight, which led to them being killed. 
or when they did fight and they lost, which led to them being killed. That's one of the things that we didn't used to see with the old time fighters, the real dog men that we were encountering 20 years ago. To them, a fighting dog was like a racing horse. It either performed or didn't. And if it didn't perform, no harm, no foul, but not worth feeding, take them out and shoot them. Among the street fighters and the street mentality that, that is invading dog fighting these days, it's a personal affront to your pride if your dog loses or won't fight. It's like the dog is dissing you. And, the, and, and so the animal is not simply eliminated because you don't want to waste money on it. The animal is basically tortured. It's punished for it's not giving you the power and control that you're seeking through it. And that's why they are electrocuted, they're hanged, they're drowned, they're bludgeoned. We didn't see that with the old timers that we used to see. They, had, they actually, they claimed to love their dogs just as, as um, other sportsmen like the animals they work with or hunters like their hunting dogs. Uh, and they saw them as working animals that either worked or didn't. They earned their keep or they didn't. And if they didn't, then you got rid of them. But not with malice, not with, with cruelty. That's not what we were seeing. And that's why Vic was killing dogs in often brutal ways because of this street fighting mentality. But he had enough money to have a lot of dogs. Um, so one of the things that impressed us about these dogs is they, we only actually had one dog of, of the 50 or the 49 that we looked at that nobody could handle. It was too human aggressive and she was euthanized. Uh, that was the only animal that was euthanized for behavioral aggression towards people. Now, some of them were quite sharp with other dogs uh, and, and needed a lot of work. But as, as you, you know, and if I do recommend this, if you haven't read it, go out and buy it. Jim Grant's a good friend uh, and really does tell the whole story. Uh, dogs went to a variety of places. Quite a few are still at, at uh, uh, Best Friends. The ones we designated that either they were suitable for adoption, they needed uh, uh, like level one rehab and, and the ultimate uh, level two is basically secure confinement and you know the next level was euthanasia. We only recommended one, I think two were euthanized for medical reasons, one for behavior reason, uh, but the rest uh, were farmed out to all these various groups. And you know, you know fighting pit bulls can never live with other dogs. <laughs> Well, that's one of, you know, uh, that's a Vic dog there, and that's his, his new brother. And I don't think they're killing each other. And you can't let them near cats. And there's a Vic dog and, and, uh, and other dogs with the cat. And uh, you know, a, lot, a lot of others, and probably, um, again, some of those that, that wound up in various locations. And again, Hector. Johnny, Dutch, Yuba, these are all Vic dogs that wound up uh, with bad rap out in the Bay Area. Uh, and some of those have gotten their canine good citizens, at least two are uh, therapy dogs. So this really was a change in our attitudes. From, quite frankly, I had helped write HSUS policy on what do we do with fighting dogs? Because 25 years ago, first of all, uh, no but he had the resources to try to care for seized dogs. And we were just seeing the beginning of the pit bull, anti-pit bull hysteria. And uh, law enforcement would not go after a dog fighter if they were going to have to be responsible for caring for the animals. What we've really forced in the last three years is the notion that fighting dogs are not the perpetrators of dog fighting, they're the victims of dog fighting. And everyone is different. And, and we've learned a lot more about dog behavior, dog aggression, dog fighting, dog fighters. And one of the things you, you learn quickly when you, you, you know, study dog fighting is that even the dog fighters acknowledge you can breed your top gamest champion, grand champion male, and your champion, grand champion female and get a litter of six pups, and five of them will lick your face and play with the cat. And one might uh, be game. And basically their, their uh, philosophy is breed the best, bury the rest. Uh, and that's 
been pretty much the philosophy, which recognizes the fact that, that, that being a fighting pit bull is not the mark of Cain, that a lot of these dogs are no different from the other good pit bulls that, that are uh, you know, very sociable, very friendly, very obedient, very affectionate. Uh, and every, you really have to, what we introduced is the notion you have to look at these animals as both individuals and as victims, not as perpetrators of the crime. And that idea is trickling down, but still the reality is the biggest obstacle to going after more dogfighting is what do we do with them? I mean, our shelters are overloaded with non-fighting pit bulls already, and that is one of the deterrents, and we're, we're trying to, to develop that. Uh, as, as you know, Vic was sentenced. Now, one of the things that made all this possible, Vic was not arrested because he was black or because he was famous. Uh, Vic was arrested because he was a criminal and a, and a dog fighter. And as I've said, if Peyton Manning had been fighting dogs the way Michael Vick was, we would have been first in line to go after him as well. Um, but also, we had the, the option of finally having the care of these animals and placement of these animals subsidized by the perpetrator. Michael Vick did have enough money to pay for that. I was there the day Michael Vick signed the check for $960,000 which created the fund to provide these animals with a dowry so that the various agencies caring for them could provide them with lifelong care that they would need. Most dog fighters that we bust do not have a million dollars in the bank. And that money has to come from somewhere. Uh, we did get an award from the US Attorney's Office for our work in the Vic case, which I, I do cherish because it shows they took it seriously. Um, this case did set important precedence. It was the first use of veterinary forensics in a federal case. Even though everybody pled, uh, we didn't have to actually introduce it, but the fact that we had that evidence and it would have held up helped get the plea. Mike Gill was a brilliant prosecuting attorney. You know, he started with the weakest links, uh, turned them, got them to rat out Vic, and basically as all the dominoes fell, Vic had no, no uh, choice but to plead guilty. Uh, it was the first time we've seen evaluation of a group of animals as individuals and as victims of the crime. And the first time we've seen a special master, uh, Rebecca Huss from Valparaiso University, named as the special master. I alluded to the Missouri 500 case. Again, this was uh, the largest dog fight raid in history after about a year and a half investigation by the Missouri Highway Patrol and Humane Society of Missouri. The lead investigator was Terry Mills with the Missouri Highway Patrol. He now works for ASPCA. Uh, sees more than 400 dogs, and that became the Missouri 400. Within a couple of weeks became the Missouri 500. And we're still doing follow-up on the puppies. Uh, virtually all the puppies were adopted eventually, and we're continuing to follow them and assess them. About um, uh, 200 of the adults were adopted. Some were uh, euthanized for medical reasons and, and probably about 150 for, for behavior reasons. Uh, these were not Michael Vick dogs. These, these were good game dogs that were very dog aggressive. Uh, we managed to handle and, and, and deal with and care for 500 fighting pit bulls without incident or you know, serious incident or injury to any people. It was an army of volunteers took over an abandoned or at least a warehouse in downtown St. Louis uh, with a, a, in a secret location that even the media never discovered um, uh, with armed guards. And uh, they were there for about four months uh, or five months. Uh, 24 arrests in the case, all have pled or been convicted. And just some of the dogs from the Missouri 500 as we seize them, and you know, we've learned, we do our due diligence of documenting every animal, every site. And again, you know, we're not afraid of these dogs. And people, people were, were, were quite amazed that you know, we're reaching, the, the cops that were there and even the feds that were there, you know, we're reaching into their mouths to check their gums and stuff like that. You put your hand in that dog's mouth, he's not gonna bite me. <laughs> um, and then recently this, this, this year, 
Uh, based on our collaboration in the past, we had the case where uh, an ATF agent had bought some dogs to, to gain entree into a drug and gun ring that just happened to like dog fighting as their recreation, and they did not want to euthanize the one dog that they were kind of used, because as one of the suspects said, well, cops don't buy dogs. So they figured, well, you bought dogs, you must not be a cop. Well, he was. Uh, and um, we aided in the removal of 41 dogs from there. Again, we had, uh, I think, four uh, arrests. And uh, uh, we have placed most of those animals as, as, as well. Again, and there were puppies there. Uh, now, you can tell from this guy's property, he does not have a million dollars. We're going to be paying for these dogs. It's Pam Reed, uh, head of our, now our anti-cruelty behavior team. And again, these, these uh, requires a lot of coordination. Right now, yeah, I think tomorrow we're starting down in Florida. Uh, we, we do incident command system training. Uh, these are paramilitary operations that need military precision to, to coordinate uh, the efforts and, and get all the data we need, get all the handling, get all the resources we need. These are expensive, large-scale uh, things. Plus, we continue to do the forensics. In this case, we had a tip that they'd had a dog fight the night before and had stashed the fighting pit back in the woods. So we found it and uh, found the disassembled pit. Uh, and Amanda Fitch, our forensic analyst, and myself took it back to police headquarters where we uh, demonstrated that the stuff on that was non-human blood, uh, and we took samples, took DNA samples. We took samples from the injured dogs. Uh, we were prepared in court to say, this dog's blood is on this uh, pit that you said was not used for dog fighting. Uh, we didn't need to. They pled guilty. Uh, and then again, when we transported the animals for relocation and rehab to various parts, head of our uh, operations for humane law enforcement, so fighting crimes is a serious business. <laughs> and we need all, all the help uh, we can get. And we can't succeed without working together. So what I try to share with uh, law enforcement is uh, we do training for you online, in person, at workshops. We will assist in planning and logistics, because these are essentially military operations. We will assist on the scene with animal handling. Even canine officers, experienced canine officers, do not know how to handle fighting dogs. Uh, and so, and we do. I mean, I've handled several hundred of them. Uh, we'll assist with dealing with the media, offering rewards. We'll help document the scene. We'll do forensics. We'll collect DNA evidence. We haven't had to use it in court yet, but the fact that it's there leads them to plead. We'll help with case packaging, expert witness testimony, in this predator-prey relationship with animal cruelty offenders, I think bringing in big guns does help. I, I, I consider it a success if, if I'm going out the door to testify in a dogfight case and I get a call from the district attorney saying, don't bother, they've pled. They saw your name on the witness list. Uh, and that happens more often than not, not just with myself, but Rob Reisman, our forensic veterinarian, some of our other staff. It shows we mean business, and we know what we're doing, we've got a good track record, we almost always win, and uh, there's no point in keeping up the fight. Uh, and what we want the general public as well as law enforcement to do is recognize animal cruelty is a serious crime. Even if there were no link, even if there were no connection, we'd obviously still be doing all this work because it's a horrible crime in and of itself. But for those who might not be so inclined to care as much about the animals as we might, having the strong evidence of that link is one of the best tools we have, the connection to many other crimes. Uh, we try to incorporate awareness of animal cruelty and animal crime scenes into basic training of, of all officers. You know, when I teach domestic violence response to New York State Police and others, I try to reinforce the point when you show up on a crime scene and the perpetrator has thrown the victim's cat against the wall and killed it. And she's probably going to recant and want to go back to him because often victims of domestic violence return three, four, five, six times. The child that witnessed this 
is too young to place on the stand, but you've got a dead cat. That's a felony offense. And if step one is not just scraping up the cat and putting it in the dumpster, but recognizing that this is valuable forensic evidence of a felony crime, we've done a lot of our work. Uh, it's, it's an uphill battle. We, not too recently, uh, uh, not, not too long ago, did have to have our humane law enforcement officers do some dumpster diving to recover a cat that had been disposed of by police in just such a case. And I keep reinforcing that, that often the cruelty to the animal is the easiest to document, and you'll often get a confession. Probably one of the lines I hear most often from those in domestic violence cases that have killed a pet was, you're arresting me for the damn cat? Yeah. That's why we've got laws. And because they basically come out and said, here's what I did. I was going to teach her a lesson. OK, Would you want to write that here on this legal pad for me? And we've got our felony confession. Um, have one or more officers specially trained. Actually, uh, we got money to send 12 Baltimore police officers through the uh, NACA Academy to learn some basic uh, animal-related crime stuff and try to train police to get to know their allies in animal care and control, in animal protection. Uh, we're there to work together. And it really, you know, this is what we've been saying for 140 plus years. We are their voice and, the, and, and, and you know, truly the, the voice of the voiceless and we're the voice in court, we're the voice in the legislatures and it, it, it's very rewarding work. And uh, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I think I've got Absolutely riveting. Riveting. Um, at this time, we'll we'll take a sure. We can take. Some. Yeah, we can take some questions for about fifteen minutes or so. Anybody? If you have to leave. I won't be offended. <laughs> it's late. Yes, ma'am. No. No, the way the canine codis works is it's only available to law enforcement. If you are a law enforcement officer who's been involved in a dog fighting case and you've collected data, you submit it to UC Davis, the veterinary genetics lab. They will tell you if there's a link to anything else in it and put you in touch with the other law enforcement agency. There was a lot of concern among some of the pit bull uh, advocates that somehow we were going to find the gene for being a pit bull, which there is no, you know, it, we're, it's not a unique breed. Uh, or we we're going to find the gene associated with dog fighting. It really is to link uh, animals to evidence and animals to other animals, and it's only available to law enforcement. Yeah. And they could link it to a dog or a Absolutely. That, that's exactly if, if you didn't hear. You know, if you had a dog fighter arrested here and um, you collected DNA and it goes to canine CODIS and they say, this dog is closely related and sometimes we'll know the familial relationship with dogs bred by this guy in Missouri or Illinois who has been, in fact, convicted of dog fighting. We've done something similar just through paper trails, through the breed registrations. Uh, I had a call actually from Interpol uh, when a bunch of pit bulls were stopped coming into London Airport. And they seemed to have fighting scars, and they had their registration papers. And they actually faxed me the dog's registration papers. And, I was, uh, and I, of the six dogs, I said, five of these dogs are related are direct descendants of dogs owned by people that have been convicted of dog fighting in the US. And they basically packed them up and sent them back home. Uh, so now we can do that genetically instead of the paperwork, because paperwork is often fudged. And, and they lie about genealogies all the time. Uh, we did a dog fight raid with HSUS many years ago. Uh, one of the dogs there uh, I you know, witnessed as our staff euthan euthanized the dog 
And about eight months later, that dog was advertised in the underground dog fighting magazines as being at stud because it was a grand champion. So they lie all the time. So we can't rely on the paperwork. We have to rely on the biology. Other questions? Yes. This is more on a personal basis. It's, um, did you have any pets when you were a child? Oh, yeah. And when did you realize this was your career path? <laughs> and have you been able to have a personal life outside of this? <laughs> <laughs> I did. I, I mean, I, I, well, I, I've recently become a, a dog friend. I, my, my daughter got a puggle as a birthday present, and I knew when she walked, walked in the door with this cute little puppy, and I said, oh, very cute, whose is it? And she said, mine. I said, no, it's going to be mine. And when she went off to college, and it's my, he's mine, but we, we love him. But no, I actually... Uh, Grew up in, in Nyack, New York, uh, actually in a farm we rented uh, from Will Gear. Uh, some of you may know he was Grandpa Walton. So we, we, we uh, had some farm animals around. Always, you know, my first dog was a, a, a collie, and we had bunnies. But uh, it, what I put in, in the introduction of one of my books, I, you know, I do credit my, my mother as a major influence of, of respect for animals, and particularly, I, maybe she was just a sloppy housekeeper, but she would always leave the spider webs intact, and she wouldn't let you know my grandmother or anybody else brush away the spider webs. She goes, "Well, that's her house, and her house isn't our house. We leave that." And that was that was a perception or a perspective that I think had stayed with me. Um, I didn't didn't start out actually. I, I started out academically. I, I wanted to be a brain surgeon, uh, and I was in an MD PhD program at University of California. But my first week, I was basically sent in to inject some stuff in a bunch of mice and then cut their heads off and see where it went. And I said, no, I don't think I want to do that. And the guy who had actually uh, given me a fellowship to come do that and be in this program said, well, maybe you'd be happier down the hall in ecology and evolution. And I packed up my, my grant and I went down the hall and a week later I was watching coyotes in the Sonoran Desert. And that's pretty much, you know, I, I just made that decision that I, uh, you know, did not want to go that route, and I really haven't looked back. Uh, and introduced to animal behavior in an undergraduate course in animal behavior, just loved it, was fascinated by it. So, but a lot of it is is just uh, you know teaching by example, and and we talk a lot in humane education about about being a good mentor and taking advantage of those teachable moments. Uh, as you know, one of the great quotes is is. is um, you know, when you teach a kid to pick up rather than stomping on a bug, it might or might not mean much to the kid, but it means a lot to the bug. Uh, and, and, and I think it means a lot to the kid, too. And, and uh, you know, that's really, I think, that's again why the other hat I often wear is being involved in, in humane education, which often does get the short shrift these days as resources dwindle. Thank you. You deserve every hug you get. Mm-hmm. <laughs> other questions? Yes, in the back. Yeah. Okay, well, the best place to start, the simplest one. I think partly, you know, if you have, uh, if, if you make that connection, first of all, make your concerns known to your legislators. You're starting at, at, at the mayoral level, city council, working your way up. If people don't get it, you know, if you've got a, a police chief that doesn't get it, if you have a police officer that doesn't get it, doesn't understand why this is an important case to you, go to the chief. If the chief doesn't get it, go to the DA. If the DA doesn't go, get it, you know, go to the city council, go to the governor. Uh, um, I, I was very impressed when I did my training for, for uh, judges a couple of weeks ago in, 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 in Maryland. Uh, the governor's wife walked in and sat through. So I know, you know, you, you, you just keep keep working up, up the path, because there's always somebody that cares. Um, and, and as we, we said, also, your lead, lead by, by example. Um, volunteering, one of the questions I get asked a lot is, is well, you know, how, how, how did you all get started in, in, in this business? Virtually everybody I know at ASPCA, at HSUS, had pretty much started out working as volunteers with their local shelters uh, in some capacity or another. That really is the best place. There's always a need, whether you're 
walking dogs, cuddling cats, uh, you know, doing data entry, whatever. Being involved in, in that world and supporting that world, uh, you know, not just supporting them financially, which you should do as well, but, but also getting involved with your local shelter. Uh, I think virtually everybody who works in a hands-on capacity with us or with HSUS pretty much began that way through, through local organizations. Yes. Right. And um, I think that's very effective. I work in the school system and I work with many public students and many of them are so impressionable by what's going right. on. And I'm wondering if something like that could be done in New York State. I mean, some of my students, I mean, their, their whole life, their role models right. really are like and, the WE. I mean, right. Yeah, one of one of the the people, and I didn't even know this guy. He, he is one one of the the uh, um, mixed martial arts champions. Is one of the, our poster guys who's got tattoos everywhere. And I love the poster of him because he's holding his cat. And first of all, you know, cats really often are, are so often the, the, the target of this. And they both had the same expression on the poster, which I which I really like. Um, you know, at our last meeting of the Baltimore Commission, we were, look, we were talking about, you know, do we need to um, copyright this, the, the whole show your soft side campaign? And the idea is, well, only to the extent that we don't want somebody else misappropriating it and making money for the wrong reasons. And right now, you know, uh, this is, uh, nobody makes money on this. In fact, the, the ad agency that's done it has sunk a lot of their own money into it. Uh, We've had some discussions of, of how to help, and actually they, they've gotten calls from groups around the country wanting to, to and I think it's great. I, the more the merrier. Um, you know, we've, we wanted to make it a, a local campaign of using local sports figures that the kids would, would know. Uh, you know, I, I, I live in, in Arlington, Virginia, but I commute to Baltimore about twice a month to work on these things, but I, I didn't know any of these. Baltimore sports figures, but the kids all did. When we had the the uh, press conference to introduce the campaign, and you know everybody was wanted their pictures taken with these these guys who I had only recently heard about, because and because we're not the audience; it is the kids. It's just, and I, I would certainly encourage um, you know encourage people to try try to find the same thing locally. Um, we're actually ASPCA was not directly involved in this campaign. It was the Baltimore, the Mayor's uh, Anti-Animal Abuse Commission, uh, and the work of that commission. Now, Caroline Griffin, who is the head of the commission, who she was a divorce lawyer, basically gave up her law practice just to work with the commission full time. She pretty much engineered this, and we just gave her an award, the President's Award at ASPCA. So. Uh, we, we have not poured money into this locally. We've talked about, you know, do we, do we, because we, we want this to be local stuff. We don't, this is not an ASPCA project. It has to be your, your lo local project. And, and I think as far as the concept and the template, and, and uh, you know, we can direct you to the people who are involved. But uh, ideally, it's not the kind of thing where you need um, outside money for. You know, you, part of the success of this is finding local people. Uh, you know, we're on billboards all over Baltimore. Well, you know, you, you find outdoor advertising companies that have got space they can't sell. They'll basically, you know, we'll put it up there for until we got somebody who's going to pay us for that space. And so it doesn't cost anybody anything except for the printing of the billboard materials, which, which was donated by uh, corporations. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yeah. The, particularly the dog fighting course through through uh, ASPCA Pro, uh, you know, they, they they can go through it. Um, and some some policemen like Baltimore is asking all their guys to go through it. All the women. Uh, just go to ASPCA Pro. There's a thing for for signing up. What they can't necessarily they can't automatically get whatever continuing edu education units they need. It's really for their own enrichment, uh, but. Uh, you know, certainly we can, we can, I think, document that they've completed the course at least. Uh, so it, it, does, it doesn't have like CLUs or CEUs. But it, that particular course is, is, is open now. The, the dogfighting <coughs> toolkit, when it becomes, we'll hold that up since 
Uh, and actually, I gave Val Valerie one of, one of the first it's copies, hot, hot off the press. It's only available to, to animal care and control, uh, veterinary professionals, law enforcement. If you want a copy of this, you have to basically email or call Department of Justice, send them something on letterhead. They actually will call you back to make sure you're for real. Because, again, it's a predator-prey thing. Originally, Department of Justice was just going to put this up on their website. And I said, no, no, the dogfighters are much more internet savvy than cops. And they'll all download this on the first day. And, and they'll, there's no great secret information, but I do have you know, what you, what you uh, want to put in, in, in a, a search warrant. And some of the common defenses that are used and how you defeat them. So there, there are, I wouldn't call them trade secrets, but there's, uh, there's more information there that I would like, and, uh, like the dogfighters to have at least too easily. Uh, but the, the course is, uh, the, the online course is pretty much open to anybody. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. If you lose sight because you'll lose your creativity, you lose the objectivity and the ability to work a team appropriately because you become so emotionally involved and end up going back to your class crying or whatever. It's, right. There's so much information that they disseminate in this course that they're looking at 140 years of suffering in a short course yeah. and losing sight of the fact that your bar graph going from 1984 to 47 states or 46 states yeah. had to happen by those people that didn't get lost right. in the uh, it's a very good point, and that's one of the reasons why you know, I oversee three departments, forensic sciences, uh, animal behavior, and counseling. And the counseling is an important part of that, to, to main, maintain that. And you're absolutely right. And I, I've seen the same kind of thing. I've been to presentations and trainings on domestic violence where the trainers are clearly victims of domestic violence who have not resolved their own issues, and they are not affected because... They, they basically fall apart with the emotion of this. When we started uh, with HSUS, had our own cruelty database doing work similar to what petabuse.com does, we had a real issue with the people who were doing the data entry were burning out because they had to read these stories every day. Partly because they were clerical people who were reading stories and inputting the data. I read hundreds of these a week but I also know I'm doing something in some of these cases. So I feel empowered to some extent. And we realize the people who are just doing the data entry and the day-to-day -day stuff, they're not empowered. They're just being bombarded by suffering, as you, you point out. And we have to deal with that. In, 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 and it's sort of like you know, euthanasia stress and, and other issues. You have to empower people to ultimately do what's the best thing for the animals. And you, you, you can't just treat it as, as number crunching. I, I think the important thing uh, is, is you know, self-care and get a life. The people, uh, when, when I used to do uh, compassion fatigue training, and one of the exercises we would do in that is I would have everybody tell me, you know, three things you like about your job. I didn't want it to be a gripe session, but also tell me, you know, three things you do outside of your job to gain some balance. And people would talk about, um, you know, sports or church or art or music. And we usually have a couple of people in each class who said, I don't have time for anything else. I've just got to help all the animals that I see. And of course, people come up to me at the break and say, she's a hoarder. You know? Because <laughs> they're the people who don't have a life, who can't achieve balance, who don't, don't see. And that is a pathology if you can't separate yourself and recognize you can't save them all. You personally probably, you know, you can save one or two, maybe yourself, but you get much beyond that, you become the hoarder. Um, and, and, and keeping the balance and, and keeping the, 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 the big perspective. And, and that is hard for a lot of people, and, and we need to help each other with, with that. And, and we do spend a lot of time on self-care and, and other care and try to be uh, compassionate people. And, and, and uh, you know, there's a lot of emphasis on that. that and that's, 
a good work environment at ASPCA. We do devote a lot of time to that. Uh, we we uh, do work a lot with our employee assistance program and, and are, do, are assessing what, and we've just developed a whole protocol, actually more for our volunteers than for our staff when we do, you know, we, we had uh, you know, 60 people in Joplin, Missouri. Uh, and very stressful times, but the, the great thing there is we would, of course, celebrate the victories. You know, we, one, one man who came back every day for eight, eight days looking for his dog, he didn't have anything else. And then, you know, one day his dog was there, and boy, did they have a big party with everybody, because it was, it was something to, to latch on to that, that kept everybody going. And, and you know, it, it, it's not false, it, it, it's necessary. Yes, ma'am. You know, we don't have, I certainly think it's a highly desirable goal. Part of the problem has been really documenting an effect. Frank Ashione, who uh, co-authored a, a book with me, had done one of the first studies actually under contract with, the, with Nahi, looking at how much of a humane education message transferred to interactions with other kids and stuff. And it's difficult to document. Partly, we don't, might not have the right tools. Um, and, and partly, I've been kind of promoting a notion of humane education triage. We have some kids out there that really get it that don't need it in the school because they are the super nurturers. Uh, they're the ones that, 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 that get it. You've got the other kids that are probably you know, the lost causes. That, 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 um, and, and that's an issue we have. If, if, let's say we spend a lot of time working with kids from violent families, teaching them compassion and caring for animals. For some kids, that can actually be a weakness. You know, you send, it's, for some kids, humane education is sort of the equivalent of cleaning an oiled seabird and throwing it back in the muck. You know, we take kids out of environments that are horrible, teach them to care, and put them back in the environments that are horrible, because we need to change, we need systemic change. It doesn't mean we should abandon them or not expose them to that, because you know, you might reach one or two or three. Uh, and then there are the kids in the middle that could go either way and having exposure to this gives them a new way of, of seeing things and it can be very helpful. And we really haven't teased all that out and that's one of the challenges in humane education is who should we be targeting, how should we be doing it? What we do know is, is that it can't just be kind of a one shot you know, visit from the nice lady from, from the animal shelter telling you to spay and neuter your dogs. It has to be integrated into the curriculum. It has to be a lifestyle almost. It has to be, and you, you can't have it. Um, I've done so many humane education things where, where uh, you know, the teacher goes out and goes to the teacher's lounge for a smoke because basically, all right, somebody else will keep the kids from chewing gum for an hour. You know, and, and, and that's not going to work. So we need to come up with, with I think, you know, more, more attention to what's needed, by whom, and what's the best way to deliver it. But I, I, I certainly think... Uh, we tend to focus on other things. And when we try to get some of that information in there, the teachers always complain about all the other things they have to cover in the curriculum, but certainly it's desirable. Yes, Samantha. Uh, I think one of the most difficult groups to get through to on um, animal resources are the people who did deal. So I'm very impressed with what you said about what happened. Well, what my, my, district, you could learn how that my district attorney friends frequently use the line, you can lead a judge to training, but you can't make them think. Um, I don't use that line when I teach judges. Um, there are a couple of ways to accomplish that. One is hold them accountable. Like you know, when this one judge sentenced uh, this offender to, actually he sentenced him to community service at the ASPCA in Baltimore. So he didn't know, we don't, you know, it's, it's the Baltimore SPCA has no direct connection with us. Um, and he just got tons of letters, including from the Baltimore SPCA, the Maryland SPCA. Uh, so part of that is just, just educating them. One of the things that can be very helpful that we're seeing more of is, is a court watch, uh, where we have advocates in the courtroom when the, these cases are being heard to document what, in fact, is being said. You, know, you don't come in you know, we're wearing your, your uh, you know, animal rights slogans or your kitty cat t-shirt, you come in professional. And actually there's a good program in Chicago for Court Watch where they have formal training. 
you take notes, you share the information, you blog, whatever. Hold people accountable. This actually was a concept that got started with a lot of the abuses in domestic violence cases where uh, you know, judges were saying just really stupid things uh, and not holding offenders accountable, including a judge in Maryland. Who, who This was in a domestic violence homicide, and he made some remark in court like, like, to the effect of, well, if I caught my wife doing that, I'd blow her away too. You know, well, obviously you petitioned the bench to have, I mean, petitioned the court to have him removed. We don't need to go that far in this, but, but that's the nice, nice things about the internet and blogs. The whole world is watching. And uh, you might not have cameras in the courtroom, but you can have notebooks. And uh, I think that's, that's one way to sensitize the judiciary. And they're getting that. They, they, they know. And, and also, as a good dog trainer, you know, you, you, you are more effective with rewarding appropriate behavior than punishing inappropriate behavior. Uh, so you know, I'm a, a big advocate of, of awards and certificate. Plaques are cheap. And, and boy, judges like stuff they put on the wall. Judges like good publicity. Reward appropriate behavior. No, don't just yeah, single out those that do stupid things, but definitely focus on those. And, and partly, we have uh, one, one judge who heads up our mental health court in Baltimore, Judge Raisin, and she uh, got it. She was asked to be on the commission. And working through her, she's the one that actually established the training for all the other judges. Because first I did a training just for her circuit court. And she said, oh, this is really good. I'd like, can, can you do this for all the judges in Maryland? I said, I'd be happy to. So you find that one judge who gets it uh, and give them what they ask for, give them what they need, and give them a lot of, lot of praise. And uh, I don't think we even had to give her a plaque because she, she gets it. But you find that one person, there's always, you know, one, there's one cop. We had problems uh, getting the chief of police in Baltimore to take the cruelty cases seriously. But the sheriff got it instantly. He, he, he's a real animal lover. He saw how useful this was. He put his guys through some of my online training. And the chief of police saw that he was getting all this nice publicity. And that's why the chief of police said, all right, I'll give you an officer. Uh, you, you, know, you can embarrass people into to do. I think you've, you've heard me say my, my favorite ways of, of, of cha affecting change, you can try to educate. Uh, or you can uh, embarrass, uh, and there are some for which the only solution is embalming. You know, you just got to wait for some of the some of these guys to die. Uh, but but uh, I always try education first, ed enforcement and education, and 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 empathy, and then if those don't work, there's always uh, you know th th there's embarrassment and and embalming. <laughs> Yes. Next semester. Um, after going through the like the Cape and the Missouri case, um, as in like the behavioral stuff that goes on, have you guys gone to any court of law for fighting animals, or is it kind of the same as shelter? Um, it is a little bit different. We we have much more, uh, and we're developing that. We haven't written that all up now, but partly we're looking at uh, you know using the fake dog whenever possible. Uh, we spend a lot more time on. Uh, dog-dog interaction issues, because those are going to be the most serious. Uh, we've never had issues, although we still do the doll type test, we've never had issues of uh, fighting dog to human aggression. They've been selected for hundreds of years to, you know, if you watch videos of dog fights, there's three guys in the pit with their faces right there and they're nudging them on. And, you know, most, a lot of dogs I know would just turn and bite you if you're in, in your face that closely. Fighting dogs have been selected to not show aggression to people for the most part. Um, so we don't do a whole lot of, of human aggression tests, although we do do um, mean stranger and stuff like that. Uh, but also we found certain tests that are standard in some shelter behavior testing, like food competition. We, um, we, we never had fighting dogs that, that would not let you take their food away. Again, they're used to, to basically submitting to the people. So we, we've kind of dropped some of those tests out and added some more that deal more with different aspects of the dog-on-dog -dog aggression. Sometimes with bad rap, we'll take it uh, to the next level. Like if they are threatening another dog, how much uh, restraint do you need to get them to not do that? Can you uh, regain control by voice command, by flat collar? Do you need to use a prong collar initially? Um, 
with, with Dragon, the dog that we got from the ATF, for his first week of in, muzzled interactions with some other dogs at, at the facility in Denver. He would occasionally charge and snap out. And they were just constantly had people around with spray bottles, and he just got a spray in the face with water. And he eventually got the message, oh, OK. And, and then if he was a good boy, he got treats. Finally said, OK, I, good things happen when I don't do bad, stupid things. And within about two weeks, he was playing with the other boys. And uh, you know, now he's not going to go into a, he, a home with children. He didn't go into a home with children. They don't have other pets, but they know what they got, and they love him. I'm talk, actually, what you can do is communicate with, with uh, uh, Pam Reed, and it's, for now it's just Pam R at ASPCA.org, or go, go to ASPCA Pro, uh, and, and we also have our, our whole pages and pages on, on our Animal Behavior Center. Uh, but talk to either uh, Pam Reed or Kristen Collins. We've got students working specifically, and we're working specifically on the puppy evaluations. I, they, They've published some of that work on our puppy evaluations. Because that's, that's always the sad part when you, know, you, you, you have pups born, and it you, you used to be that people said, well, you know, the spawn of Satan, they, they, they've got the, the mark of Cain, we can't do anything with these fighting dog puppies. And it's true that some of the puppies born are kind of dog aggressive, but most aren't. And that's one of the things we try to assess for. And how dog aggressive are they, and what do you need to do to, to uh, correct that, or can you? And again, every animal is an individual. Yes. What are you doing, or are you doing anything to educate the judges on animal reporting and the problems with animal reporting and allowing them to still eat animals? Oh yeah, now this is uh, uh, I actually the judge training of probably a, a, a part of that deal specifically with animal hoarding because you have the whole issue of, and, and I've, gotten, I've gotten letters from judges for being too mean to sweet old ladies, you know, that, that we have convicted on 15 counts of felony animal cruelty because they had cats with their eyeballs falling out. Uh, and they just don't get it, uh, not just the pain and suffering that they're producing, but uh, this is, and, and this is a, a recurring issue of, of uh, when we go for no contact orders, um, judges do not like to take people's stuff away from them. You know, the, the most hotly defended American right is your right to own whatever you want, whether it's a you know, wolf hybrid or an AK-47 or whatever else. And uh, we've got, as, as uh, Stacey Wolf and I say, we, we've got that pesky Fourth Amendment, which basically unjustifiable search and seizure. Uh, so judges are very reluctant to take people's stuff away from them, even though even when you've clearly made the case that they cannot take care of that. Um, and that is an education, and we are doing it, and we are writing more stuff for that. But yeah. Oh, yeah, no, and, and, and we, we certainly um, bombard them with material from the you know, Tufts Hoarding of Animals website. And, and uh, um, Part of the problem is there's, there is no uniform training for either judges or district attorneys. There's one judge school in Reno, Nevada, like twice a year. Uh, but um, you know, and in, in New York State, you don't even have to be a lawyer to be a judge. So uh, that's part of the training problem. And, and, and uh, I don't think that's going to change anytime soon. Dr. Lockwood has had a very long day. <laughs> I'm going to drive him where he needs to go. <laughs> okay. so. Thank you all. I mean, Thank you. If anybody wants an autograph or anything, come on. <laughs> <laughs> My students, if you have not signed the attendance, I need to know you are here. Thank you all very much. Quality of participation, not quantity. Thank you. That's a good point. Thanks.